Hi, everyone. This is number 37 in my podcast series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. And in this podcast, we're going to take a look at Chief Pontiac's Rebellion. The French and Indian War had gone well for the British. They had succeeded in conquering French Canada and were now in control of the Great Lakes region and just about everything east of the Mississippi River, including the coveted Ohio country where the war began. This was an area more than 12 times the size of England and included many different Indian nations. The French had done a good job getting along with these Indians by keeping them dependent on them for the necessary products that the Indians could not manufacture themselves, especially firearms and ammunition. The French also lavished gifts on the Indians, thus buying their friendship. It was an expensive policy, but it kept the Indians friendly and mostly loyal, and so was probably cheaper in the long run. When the British took over, they unwisely decided to end the conciliatory policies the French had implemented. This is what started Pontiac's Rebellion. Indian dissatisfaction with the new policies of the British caused them to further evaluate their relationship with the Europeans in general, which caused the conflict to spread and deepened the bitterness. Even though I've chosen to call this conflict Pontiac's Rebellion, it could just as accurately be called the Indian Trade War. It's important to keep in mind that more Indian tribes abstained from the conflict than joined it, and many of them were unhappy with the rebellion because it destroyed their trade. In a previous podcast I did about the Iroquois Confederation, I talked about what happened when Indians and Europeans made first contact. Usually within a generation or two, the Indians became dependent on Europeans for things they couldn't produce, especially firearms and ammunition. Without firearms, the Indians couldn't hunt and they couldn't defend themselves against rival Indian tribes that had firearms. So they were constantly dependent on the Europeans for these items that they couldn't produce themselves. Not only did the French supply the Indians with these things, but they also kept gunsmiths in their fort to repair Indian firearms as well as their own. Sir Geoffrey Amherst, the commander-in-chief of British forces in North America, unwisely decided to end these policies the French had done. He saw the Indians more as an expensive nuisance rather than as a source of alliance and trade. In a letter he wrote, Purchasing the good behavior of the Indians by presence and keeping them scarce of ammunition is not less to be recommended. I think it much better to avoid all presence in the future since that will oblige them to supply themselves by barter and of course keep them more constantly employed by means of which they will have less time to concert or carry into execution any schemes prejudicial to his majesty's interests. Nothing can be so impolitic as to furnish them with the means of accomplishing the evil which is so much dreaded. Perhaps part of Amherst's reluctance to give the Indians ammunition and and firearms was that many of these Indians helped the French during the French and Indian War, so I can see some logic in what he's doing. Many of the officers, however, that were out on the frontier had a better, more accurate view of things, and Amherst wasn't listening to them. One captain wrote, All the Indian nations have gone to their hunting, and by that means will be quiet here till spring. I hope the general will will change his present way of thinking with regard to Indian affairs. I am of the opinion if they were supplied with ammunition, it would prevent their doing mischief. Sir William Johnson, who was the King's Superintendent of Indian Affairs, wrote a letter to Amherst saying, There is, in my opinion, a necessity for putting some clothing, ammunition, etc. into the hands of the commanding officers at Oswego, Niagara, and Detroit to be occasionally given to such Indians as are found deserving and serviceable, and as if they had been used heretofore to receive presents in such abundance. I submit it to your excellency whether it will be thought convenient to break off that expense all at once until everything be entirely settled throughout the country. Another British officer made this comment in a letter to Amherst. He wrote, The Indians are a very jealous people, and they had great expectations of being very generally supplied by us, and from their poverty and mercenary disposition, they can't bear such a disappointment. Undoubtedly, the general has his own reason for not allowing any present or ammunition to be given them, and I wish it may have its desired effect, but I take this opportunity to acquaint you that I dread the event, as I know Indians cannot long per- persevere. They are a rash, inconsistent people and inclined to mischief and will never consider consequences, though it may end in their ruin. Their success, the beginning of this war on our frontiers, is too recent in their memory to suffer them to consider their present inability to make war with us, And if the Senecas, Delawares, and Shawnees should break with us, it will end in a general war with all the Western nations, though they at present seem jealous of each other. And this officer's uh, predictions were exactly right. And unfortunately, Amherst wasn't listening to his officers on the frontier. The dissatisfaction over trade issues caused the Indians to look at other areas of dissatisfaction. 
For one thing, with the French, they had a certain camaraderie. Many of the uh, Frenchmen took uh, Indian wives, and they felt like they were part of the same team, whereas the British were kind of aloof. I've mentioned in past podcasts that the British English generally had kind of a separatist attitude towards the Indians. There were also the land issues. The British saw themselves as conquering French lands, and the Indians insisted that the land never belonged to the French in the first place, and therefore all the French, all the British had done is kick the French out of their land. So that was another big issue. One of the interesting things that was happening leading up to Pontiac's rebellion was the preaching of a certain Delaware Indian named Neil, and he was seen as a prophet who had had a conversation with the Master of Life, sometimes called the Great Spirit. In this conversation, the Master of Life told him that he was displeased with the Indians for their drunkenness, for their adultery, for their polygamy. Indian tribes are generally polygamous at this time. In fact, Pontiac had more than one wife. And he was also unhappy with Indians for allowing the Europeans to settle their land. According to one account, the Master of Life told Neolin, quote, This land where ye dwell I have made for you and not for others. Whence comes it that ye permit the whites upon your lands? Can ye not live without them? I know that those whom ye call the children of your great father, meaning the French there, supply your needs. But if ye were not evil as ye are, ye could surely do without them. Ye could live as ye did live before knowing them, before those whom ye call your brothers had come upon your lands. Did ye not live by the bow and arrow? Ye had no need of gun or powder or anything else, and nevertheless ye caught animals to live upon and to dress yourselves with their skins. But those who come to trouble your lands, drive them out and make war upon them. I do not like them at all. They know me not and are my, are my enemies. Send them back to the lands which I have created for them and let them stay there. Drive off your lands those dogs clothed in red who will do you nothing but harm. And of course, red meaning the British because their uniforms are red. So this Delaware prophet named Neolin, here he's preaching this kind of return to basics, back to getting back to the primitive ways that they had before the Europeans arrived. And this is firing up the Indian tribes. And Pontiac was a believer in Neolin's teachings, but he kind of modified it. He didn't completely accept it. He instead modified it to use it only against the British. He didn't seem to mind the French. On the screen now is a map depicting what North America looked like at the end of the French and Indian War, just before Pontiac's rebellion started. The British were in the process of taking possession of all the backcountry forts that the French had surrendered. And basically the British got everything east of the Mississippi River except for Louisiana. These are represented by the red squares scattered between Pittsburgh, Fort Niagara, and Fort Edward Augustus in Green Bay, which is the one that's on the left side of the Great Lakes. And among these was the fort and town of Detroit, where Pontiac's Rebellion begins. The blue forts along the Mississippi River were still under French control, until the British could arrange to occupy them. The names of Indian tribes are in italics. The map shows their general location at the time of Pontiac's Rebellion broke out, but we should keep in mind that their position was fluid. The Indians were migrating. Sometimes pieces of an Indian nation might migrate somewhere else or be near other Indian nations. It just depended, so it wasn't a static map at all. On the screen now is a map showing what the area of Detroit and its environs looked like at the time that Pontiac's Rebellion started. You can see where the town of Detroit is. The little black box right next to the river there is the fort, and it's surrounded by the buildings of the town represented by the little dots. You can see the little teepees along the river. Those represent the Indian camps. Those were established close to Detroit long before the British came. uh, Detroit was an important distribution center from the French to the Indians, and so they set up their own settlements there to be near Detroit, and there were sometimes fights between the Indians. Many French people had settled near Detroit during the time that uh, France owned the area, and once the British took it over, they decided to stay. I've represented their farms with the little yellow squares along the river near Detroit. Many of them were engaged in farming. Some of them had decided to flee to Louisiana, but many of them stayed there. They were kind of a source of trouble. Some of them were. They stirred up the Indians. They sided with them. They wanted Pontiac to destroy the British, and they had connections with their relatives down in Louisiana. Pontiac was a war chief of the Ottawa tribe, and his hatred for the British, which comes through very clearly in his speeches, made him kind of a lightning rod for Indian resentment. And many warriors from other tribes and other chiefs came to support him there near Detroit. And Pontiac began holding councils with some of the other Indians in the area and giving speeches, fiery speeches. In fact, at one of the speeches, he said, It is important for us, my brothers, that we exterminate from our lands this nation which seeks only to destroy us. You see as well as I that we can no longer supply our needs as we have done from our brothers, the French. So he was he was very intent on kicking the English out. So Pontiac and the other chiefs come up with a plan that they're going to go into the British fort there at Detroit and they'll have weapons under their blankets. They'll have blankets on them and 
the pretext will be they're coming in to talk to the British commander about certain items of business. And then a certain signal Pontiac is supposed to give. The other Indians will then throw off their blankets, take their weapons and massacre the garrison and everyone inside the fort. And this is kind of classic the way the Indians in differentiation from the European way. Indians resort to subtle ploys and kind of sneaky tricks. Europeans just come crashing in with their artillery and troops. And so on May 7th, 1763, Pontiac and about 200 other Indians come into the fort on this pretext of talking to the British commandant, a Major Gladwin. But Gladwin had gotten news of this trick, and he had all his men at arms, all ready with their bayonets fixed, all ready for battle. And when the Indians come in, they realize something's happened, so Pontiac never gives the signal, and they leave the fort. So this situation is highly embarrassing to Pontiac, and he's angry about it. It kind of makes him lose some prestige. So he blames an Indian woman that he sure tipped off the British to their plan. He drags her into the fort and tells Gladwin, the, the commander, that this woman had given him wrong information, that it was a lie, that the Indians' had only, intent, only intention was to come in and have a peaceful conference. But with the British alerted to their tricks, there's not much Pontiac can do. As an interesting side note, the story goes that later in life, this woman, who was quite drunk and fell into a vat of boiling maple syrup, that's how she met her death. Pontiac was enraged at his inability to take over the fort with the trick, and so he decided to vent that anger on local English farmers and others who happened to be outside of the fort. Some of them were killed in gruesome ways. One victim was boiled and eaten and his skin of his arm was pulled off and turned into a tobacco pouch. And so these were, these were some of the things that happened to people outside the fort. Within a week, Pontiac had killed 15 English men and women, wounded five, and captured 15. And at this point, it kind of settles into a siege situation where the Indians can't really attack, and the British can't do much either. And it's going to become a battle of who can outlast the other. Pontiac had between four and 500 warriors, and later that number would increase to nearly about 1,000 estimated as other surrounding tribes and villages would send men and supplies to help him out. There was really no way for the Indians to attack the fort without taking huge numbers of casualties. I think there were about 120 to 150 British inside the fort, and this included men with arms that weren't soldiers but were helping to defend it. Roving patrols of Indian warriors prowled around the fort engaging in firefights with soldiers who were manning the walls, but without artillery, it, there was no way for a Pontiac's men to actually ever take the fort over or to batter it down. And so Pontiac's only hope was to try and starve out the British. During this time, Pontiac sent pleas for help to the French down in Louisiana, and he especially wanted someone knowledgeable in siege engineering and troops to come to help him, which never did happen. The French never sent anyone. The commander of the British inside the fort was Major Gladwin. He was a resourceful officer, and during uh, lulls in the fighting, he would bring in supplies when he could. He removed buildings that were close to the fort that the Indians were using as cover to snipe at British soldiers on the walls, and he sometimes organized sorties. These were little attacks to, to rush out of the fort and attack the Indians when he could. I mentioned earlier the French people that were still living there, the ones that had decided to stay even though the English took it over. They had kind of a hard situation. The British were constantly suspicious of them helping the Indians and many of them did. Some of them were sympathetic to Pontiac and what the Indians were doing. But they also had grief the other direction. Pontiac felt they weren't doing enough, and sometimes he'd come and commandeer supplies from them. All right, if you look at the map, you can see that Detroit is right alongside a river, and that's the Detroit River. The British had two small ships on that river. One was a sloop and one was a schooner. These are not large ships, but they both had artillery, small artillery pieces on them. And the Indians had no effective way of really dealing with them. They, they tried to attack them. They made uh, some valiant efforts to attack or destroy the ships, but they failed ultimately. One of the things that Pontiac tried to deal with these boats was he had some, some boats of his own. These are smaller boats, bateaux they're called. And he set these on fire and set them down the river hoping they would hit the British ships. In the end, they didn't do any damage, but it was kind of a clever idea. And it's one of the kinds of strategies Europeans had been using for centuries to destroy each other's ships. The Detroit River was a problem for Pontiac because ultimately he was not able to keep the British from supplying the fort. So the British were able to get supplies and reinforcements to the fort. And he, had, he really had no way of stopping them. He tried. He did capture one supply ship. But other than that, that was a critical weakness in his plan. He had no way of dealing with this river and the ships. The British had ships with cannons on them. He couldn't stop them. In fact, one British ship actually sailed up where Pontiac's village was and shelled it. Soon after Pontiac began his attacks at Detroit, other Indian nations joined the rebellion, including the Delaware, the Shawnee, Mingo, and the Seneca. The British quickly lost control of the back country, and on the map on the screen, you can see the little red explosions. Each one of those is a fort that the Indians successfully took over or destroyed. 
The northwesternmost fort, Fort Edward Augustus, which is in Green Bay, was quickly abandoned by the British. They couldn't control it anymore once the war spread out. And so Detroit then became the westernmost British outpost. The other two forts that were able to hold out were Fort Niagara and Fort Pitt, which is today Pittsburgh. On the map, you can see a blue line connecting Detroit and Fort Niagara. That was the supply route I talked about earlier, where the British were able to keep Detroit supplied. The Seneca tried to attack the portage area when the men were carrying supplies from Lake Ontario to ships that were waiting on Lake Erie. They were not successful in cutting the supply lines and the British continued to hold out at Detroit. Because these forts were so isolated from each other, there were really no roads. The roads were the rivers. All the forts were built near rivers. And these forts weren't getting word that other forts had been attacked. So the Indians were able to use some of their clever tricks and subtleties to capture them. For example, at one fort, the Indian women came into the fort with blankets, and under their blankets they had weapons. Their men were outside of the fort playing a game of lacrosse, and after the game was over, the jubilant team and all of them came running into the fort, grabbed the weapons from their women, and then quickly massacred the garrison of the fort. If you happened to be captured and you were in one of these forts, you could expect some pretty brutal and gruesome treatments. Very frequently or normally, victims or captives were scalped. Some survived the scalping, some didn't. The Indians might kill one of the captives and eat them, one young lieutenant was slowly roasted alive. Another man had his heart cut out and, and the heart was eaten. Sometimes the heart was rubbed on the faces of other captives. And in some cases, the captives were actually fed on the flesh of other captives that had been killed. One of the men who was able to hide and was not killed was able to account or recount what he had seen happening in the fort. He wrote, Through an aperture which afforded me a view of the area of the fort, I beheld in shapes the foulest and most horrible, the ferocious triumphs of barbarian conquerors. The dead were scalped and mangled. The dying were writhing and shrieking under the unsatiated knife and tomahawk. And from the bodies of some ripped open, their butchers were drinking the blood, scooped up in the hollow of joined hands, and quaffed amid shouts of rage and victory. On the map, the reddish triangle area shows generally the area subjected to Indian raids. And Pennsylvania got the worst of it because of the Quakers that controlled the state. They weren't interested in spending money on self-defense. This is very similar to what happened during the French and Indian War when the Indians were able to raid the western frontiers and settlements. In all, about 2,000 people were killed or captured. Like the unfortunate persons who were captured in the forts, Many of the people that were captured in these raids were brutalized and gruesome things were done to them. There's one story about a woman who was shrieking and crying uncontrollably and the Indians got tired of hearing her so they shoved her husband's scalp into her mouth to gag her. In another case, a baby was crying in a woman's arm. She was carrying the baby and the Indians got tired of hearing the baby so they grabbed it out of her hands and clubbed the baby's head against a tree. Afterwards, when relief came to these outlying settlements to try and help the the settlers, they would find people mangled and brutalized. Some men had owls pierced into their eyes. It was pretty horrible. It's important to keep in mind that not all of the Indians supported what Pontiac and his men were doing. A lot of them complained to him of the, the gruesomeness the unnecessary cruelty, and the cannibalism. The colonists, especially in Pennsylvania, were outraged by these attacks and the atrocities. The situation in Pennsylvania was particularly angry because the Quaker legislature there would not do much to provide defense for the colony. So a group of frontiersmen, known to history as the Paxton Boys, decided they would seek revenge by attacking a nearby Indian village that was actually friendly. These were friendly Indians, but I think they were so drunk with anger and hatred that they descended on this Indian village and started killing and scalping all the Indians they could. Some of the Indians sought refuge in a local jail, and the local uh, law enforcement attempted to protect them, but there was no way they could. And this mob, which was almost 100 men, broke into the jail and killed the Indians that were there. Many of these friendly Indians had, uh, had fled to Philadelphia for protection, and when the Paxton boys came there to try and get them, luckily through the efforts of Ben Franklin and the local militia, they were able to stave off any further violence. The governor of Pennsylvania was outraged. He actually issued an arrest warrant for these guys. General Amherst was outraged as well. In fact, he issued an order to all of his subordinate officers that there was a, going to be a take-no-prisoner policy. They were ordered to just simply kill any Indian captives they caught during combat. And Amherst issued a $100 bounty on Pontiac as well, hoping someone might kill him and bring him in. The feelings of bitterness were so strong that Amherst actually discussed with some of his subordinates the possibility that they could get smallpox-infected blankets and give them to the Indians, kind of a germ warfare. And in fact, at least one person did attempt this, 
By early October of 1763, there was certainly a fatigue setting in in the fort at Detroit. Major Gladwin, the commander of the fort, wrote, I am brought into a scrape and left in it. Things are expected of me that can't be performed. I could wish I had quitted the service seven years ago and that somebody else commanded here. Unbeknownst to Major Gladwin, though, things weren't going that much better for Pontiac. He hadn't been able to take over the fort at Detroit. and There was little chance that he was going to. He hadn't been able to get help from the French. Officially, in fact, they were encouraging Pontiac to bury the hatchet. Support for Pontiac's leadership was also waning. Uh, He and his men were running low on ammunition as well, and the weather was getting cold. In fact, it was getting too cold to carry on the siege. So late in October, Pontiac sent a message in to Major Gladwin in the fort, requesting that they come to some kind of truce or peace agreement. He sent a letter in that said, My brother, the word which my father, meaning the French, has sent me to make peace, I have accepted. All my young men have buried their hatchets. I think you will forget the bad things which have taken place for some time past. Likewise, I shall forget what you may have done to me in order to think of nothing but good. I, the Chippewas, Hurons, we are ready to go speak with you when you ask us. Give us an answer. I am sending this resolution to you in order that you may see it. If you are as kind as I, you will make me a a reply. I wish you a good day. Pontiac. The Major Gladwin inside the fort was more than happy to end the the conflict and end the siege, so he agreed to a peace agreement with Pontiac. Shortly after the peace agreement, Gladwin sent a letter to Amherst reporting what had happened, and he wrote, They have lost between 80 and 90 of their best warriors, but if your excellence still intends to punish them further for their barbarities, it may be easily done without any expense to the crown by permitting a free sale of rum, which which will destroy them more effectually than fire and sword. But on the contrary, if you intend to accommodate matters in the spring, which I hope you will for the above reasons, it may be necessary to send up Sir William Johnson. I believe as things are circumstanced, it would be for good of His Majesty's service to accommodate matters in the spring. By that time, the savages will be sufficiently reduced for want of powder, and I don't imagine there will be any danger of their breaking out again, provided some examples are made of our good subjects, the French, who set them on. Gladwin also went on to give Amherst his opinion. It would probably be a good idea not to continue the war against them because it would just push them further west, and the French would give them everything they needed to continue the fighting, and it would probably ruin their fur trade too. So even though Pontiac had agreed to peace, it really only amounted to a temporary truce. And I think if Pontiac and his followers had more gunpowder and ammunition and the weather had been better, they would have continued the attack at Detroit. So in the meantime, Pontiac leaves Detroit and he goes into the back country, stirring up the Indians in what is today Indiana and in Illinois, the Illinois Indian Confederation along the Mississippi River. And all this time he's lobbying the French for help and sending messages to the governor of Louisiana, hoping for troops or at least supplies. Rumors were flying, too. In fact, there was a rumor among the Illinois that the British had decided to relocate the Cherokee Indians into that area, and it sent them into near hysterics. And this all played well, of course, into Pontiac. The Illinois country Indians were already very uh, hostile and anti-British to begin with, so it wasn't hard to stir them up. Pontiac finally makes his way to Fort de Chartres, which was one of the most powerfully built forts in the backcountry. You can see it there on the map along the Mississippi River between Cahokia and Kaskaskia. And while he's at the fort, he has a conversation with the commandant, a guy, the French commandant of the fort, a guy named Villiers. And some of Pontiac's lengthy speech has been captured. I want to read a couple of snippets of it just to give you the tone of where he was still at. He's hardly in a frame of mind to peace. So he tells the French commandant, he said, I come to discover to thee my heart and to know of thee thyself what thou thinkest. I have left my army at Detroit who continue there the war against the English and who will not end it until there are no more red men. They would rather die with their tomahawks in their hands than live in slavery with which the English menace them. Assemble all the French chiefs and the inhabitants. I shall be happy that they understand what I have to say to thee. The master of life that made us red loves us as much as them, and we are as dear to him as they are. It is him that has inspired us to do what we do. My father, I pray thee to tell the governor of Warmtown, that's New Orleans, to have pity on us, or at least on our wives and children, that they 
they may have wherewithal to live while we attend the answer of the king, meaning the king of France. I pray thee, my father, once more to have regard to our wives and children, that they may have their supplies and powder to subsist them. We will not make the least use of it. It is for them only that we ask it. All thy children, my father, even when beat and conquered by the English, love better to die than to fail the French in anything. Be persuaded that we will not finish the war with the English whilst there remains one of us red men. So after giving this speech, Pontiac sits down and de Villiers, the French commandant, tells him again, you've got to make peace. This is not this war is not in your best interest or in the best interest of the French. According to the account, Pontiac was angry and interrupted de Villiers saying, no, I hate them. What thou tellest me is not the first or second time. It is a long time thou hast told me the same thing. If this peace is made, it will not last forty moons, since it is true these are the sentiments of all thy red children. My father, thou art charged with my talk. Recollect it is in behalf of thy children, the savages. The war will continue just to that moment. In November of 1763, Geoffrey Amherst went back to England, and General Thomas Gage took his place as commander-in-chief of British forces in North America. We'll have a lot to say about Gage in future podcasts since he was in this position as commander-in-chief when the War of Independence broke out. The following summer, the British decided it was time to go on the offensive, and they decided to have two campaigns going simultaneously to try and frighten the Indians into making peace. On the map there, you can see where Fort Pitt is. From Fort Pitt, Colonel Bouquet was supposed to go due west into the heart of Delaware and Shawnee country. He was a very experienced officer. He was actually from Switzerland, but he was probably one of the best officers the British had. During the French and Indian War, he was at a conference that George Washington was at where he disclosed the route they were going to take to Pittsburgh, and Washington disagreed with him quite a bit, so they did know each other. Bouquet's campaign was was a success. He got the Indians there to seek peace. He overawed them. The Indians could be overawed quite easily if you presented a big military force. They'd be likely to sue for peace. That's exactly what happened. Now, just to the north of Bouquet's campaign, you can see where Colonel Bradstreet's force goes. Now, Colonel Bradstreet was not nearly as good as an officer. His assignment was to go from Niagara down Lake Erie and stop along the south shore of Lake Erie from place to place, helping Bouquet and backing him up, and then go to Detroit and relieve whatever was going on there in terms of the siege or any problems that might be continuing with the Indians there. The Indians tricked Bradstreet. When he landed on the South Shore, they sent to him several representatives who claimed they were ready to make peace. He signed a peace agreement with them, which he didn't have authority to do. And then as soon as he left, they continued fighting. And Gage was furious at him for this. So they they tricked him quite a bit. By the time Bradstreet got to Detroit, the fighting was basically over, and he actually considered giving Pontiac a pension, a captain's pension, which ironically kind of caused division among the Indian chiefs because the other Indian chiefs were now kind of jealous. Like, what did he do to deserve a pension from the British Army? Now, on the way back from Detroit, his his flotilla had some problems with a storm, and they were camped at a place that today is now called Bradstreet Park, and it's in Cleveland. They did eventually make it back, but his his uh, mission was not nearly, I don't think, successful as Bouquet's was. With these British military successes, they were able to send ambassadors further west into the backcountry to talk to both Pontiac as well as other Indian chiefs and eventually kind of get Pontiac to come around to the idea that he needed to make peace. They were, su- they were successful at that. In the summer of 1766, at Fort Ontario, all the Indian chiefs, including Pontiac, were invited to attend a peace congress. And here they did enter into a formal agreement of peace with the British. By this time, Pontiac had come around fully. He was now supporting the British as much as he had supported the French. At the peace congress, Pontiac stood up and he gave a speech to Sir William Johnson, who was the king's superintendent of Indian affairs. And it was pretty lengthy, so I'll read just this little part of it. He says, Father, we heartily thank you for your present and are well convinced thereby of the goodness of the great king, our father. And he's speaking of George the Third now as his father, just as he's spoken of the French king as his father. So continuing, he said, And shall follow your advice in conserving it in the, in the manner you mention. Father, we acquiesce in everything you have said, both as to trade and everything else, being convinced you do everything for our good. We heartily wish all the English may continue to us their promised friendship, and we hope to convince you by our future conduct that we are thankful for the good advice we have received and determined to fulfill our engagements. 
I think the single biggest factor that caused Pontiac and many of the other Indians to want to make peace with the English was the fact that they realized the French weren't going to help them. The French were done in North America. And I think this one thing was probably the single biggest factor. There were others too, I think, but that was probably the biggest and most important. Making peace with the English came at kind of a price for Pontiac, and much of the rest of his life is kind of sad. He became kind of an outcast, where he'd once been this great leader, and now he was not really wanted among many of his people. Some people still respected them, but a lot didn't. There are some interesting anecdotes about things that Pontiac did after he made peace. Some of them are somewhat a little grisly. But one thing he did is that afterwards, he went around signing some deeds in uh, near Detroit. Many of the English and French people that settled there thought that if they got him to sign their deed, it might give their claim to the land a little more weight. Pontiac was also summoned to give testimony in a court case in Detroit. What had happened during the war when he started making war on the settlers around Detroit, a family, the Fisher family, their daughter apparently was thrown into a river and drowned by a Frenchman who was with Pontiac. Pontiac witnessed all that. So Pontiac testified, and apparently this young girl, she was seven years old, her name was Betty Fisher, she was very sick, she had soiled herself, she was trying to stay near his fire to stay warm, and in the process, some of that got on him, and he was angry and threw her in the river, and then told one of the Frenchmen nearby to to be a man and get rid of her, so he went in the river and drowned her. So after he gave testimony about this, the family of the Frenchmen started pressuring him. They knew that nothing could happen to him because of the peace agreement to try and take the whole blame that he had drowned the girl when really he hadn't. And of course, all the other testimony came out and he did try to backpedal, but it was kind of too late. On the map near the Mississippi River, you can see where the town of Cahokia is. This is one of the largest and oldest French settlements in what is today modern Illinois. The British had taken control of the east side of the Mississippi River including Fort de Chartres, Cahokia, and Kaskaskia. On the other side of the river, the French had founded a new town called St. Louis, which is a large city today in Missouri. It was in Cahokia that Pontiac met his untimely death by assassination. There had been rumors that he was going to lead an army of northern Indians and British against the Mississippi River Indians, the Illinois Confederation. And he was kind of become hated at this point because of his friendship with the British. So near Cahokia, there was a village of Peoria Indians, and three of them decided they were going to assassinate him. So one of them went into this trading post with him, and as they came out, he clubbed him, he clubbed Pontiac over the head, and his friends came out, and they stabbed him, and they all ran off. That was on April 20th, 1769. There's some disagreement about where his body was buried. There's some sources say Cahokia. It seems like most of them point to St. Louis. St. Louis at that time was a new French settlement. Now it's a big city. But it does seem he was buried there, and it's in an area that's pretty close to the river downtown in what is today St. Louis. There were fears that this assassination would start a general Indian war, which it could have earlier if this had happened. But because Pontiac had lost so much Uh, following and prestige among the Indians of the North because he made peace with the British. There was never a general Indian war, but there were, there were some revenge taken. There were, there were a couple of Kaskasia Indians that were scalped and found dead. And also a couple of Chippewa Indians came down. They were convinced that the clerk in the trading post was in cahoots with the people that assassinated Pontiac. They were going to capture him and torture him into telling where these guys had hid or where they went, but that never ended up happening. If I had been the British commander-in-chief, Thomas Gage, I think I might have been tempted to offer Pontiac a leadership position. He obviously had some talent and charisma. I don't see why they didn't maybe make him a commander of a body of rangers that could scour the backcountry. It could have been a very effective fighting force. Then again, maybe they didn't trust him anymore after all that he had done. He might have turned on them again or something. The last thing I want to talk about has to do with the purple line on the map, the Proclamation Line of 1763. As the news of Pontiac's um, siege of Detroit and other fighting reached London, the king and his advisors realized they needed to do something to stop the fighting in the backcountry. So the king issued a proclamation which kind of drew a line up the the continent there. You can see the purple line. Colonists, they were not allowed to go west of that line or settle west of it. They were hoping this would keep them out of conflicts with the Indians. In this proclamation, the king said, And we do hereby strictly forbid on pain of our displeasure all our loving subjects from making any purchases or settlements, whatever, or taking possession of any of the lands above reserved without our especial leave and license for that purpose first obtained. 
And then he went on to say, And whereas great frauds and abuses have been committed in purchasing lands of the Indians, to the great prejudice of our interests, and to the great dissatisfaction of the said Indians, in order therefore to prevent such irregularities for the future, and to the end that the Indians may be convinced of our justice, and determine resolution to remove all reasonable causes of discontent, we do with the advice of our privy council strictly enjoin, and require that no private person do presume to make any purchase from the said Indians of any lands reserved to the said Indians within those parts of our colonies where we have thought proper to allow settlement, but that if at any time any of the said Indians should be inclined to dispose of the said lands, the same shall be purchased only for us in our name, meaning only purchased for the king and in the name of the king, at some public meeting or assembly of the said Indians to be held for that purpose by the governor or commander-in-chief of our colony, respectively within which they shall lie. So the king recognized that there had been unscrupulous things done to the Indians and, and things like that. So he was trying to prevent these irritations. The colonists resented this greatly. They felt like they had done a great amount of work and sacrificed a great deal to tame the backcountry, both its land and the Indians. They just simply ignored this uh, restriction and moved west anyway. And it was a source of irritation that led to the American Revolution, too, an event that at this point was barely a decade away. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. Atlas of the North American Indian by Carl Waldman, The Scratch of a Pen, 1763, and the Transformation of North America by Colin G. Calloway, Pontiac and the Indian Uprising by Howard H. Peckham, Colonial Pennsylvania, A History by Joseph Illick, The American Heritage Book of Great Historic Places, edited by Richard M. Ketchum, The Indian Diplomacy of Captain Richard B. Lernout, British Military Commandant of Detroit, 1774-1775, by Paul L. Stevens, published in the Michigan Historical Review, Volume 13, Number 1, Spring, 1987, and General Amherst and Germ Warfare, by Bernard Nolenberger, published in the Mississippi Valley Historical Review, Volume 41, Number 3, December, 1954.